Awesome. So our next uh, speaker is Aaron Hodson, um, who is a master's student with Lee Gable. Um, and so Erin did her undergraduate studies here at the University of Calgary in biology and chemistry and finished that in 2022. And then is now doing a master's in biomedical engineering um, with both Dr. Lee Gable and Dr. Elizabeth Condoliff. Um, at ACRI, and um, her research focuses on bone health in pediatric populations with no neuromotor impairments. And, um, and so in terms of like a fun fact about Erin, so she can be found um, in the mountains on the weekends skiing and hiking um, and playing with her dogs. Um, so today she's going to be giving us a talk on um, the influence of robotic walking on bone and muscle health in uh, pediatric youth with cerebral palsy. Accelerated cerebral fragility, 
so they lose their bone mass faster and are more at risk for, for, for osteoporosis. So to combat that, we're trying to find ways that we can optimize bone health in childhood and adolescents to get greater scores to withstand their, their normal losses throughout life. To do this, we're assessing the influence of a robotic walker called the Traxo Trainer. The Traxo Trainer is a pair of robotic legs attached to a stable frame called the Rift Encaser. It has an external battery pack, so you can use it out in the community, school, or at home, which is very important, so it removes you from that clinical setting. It also has a removable seat, so you can adjust it for the participant's comfort or remove it altogether to provide semi or full weight bearing capability. So with this, we hypothesized that walking in a traxo trainer will provide sufficient load to the lower limbs to improve their bone density, structure, and strength, as well as their muscle cross-sectional area in this non ambulatory population. To do this, this um, the bone portion is part of a larger clinical trial at the Alberta Children's Hospital. It's called Robotic Walking for Children Who Cannot Walk, or Robocala. It includes 19 participants who are unable to walk independently, so that GMSCS level three through five. The ages range from four to 21 years of age, and they just they must meet the TREXO requirements, which are about five feet six inches and 150 pounds. There's a whole bunch of assessments included in this. I'm going to focus today only on the assessments pertinent to the bone and muscle health. So at, immediately prior to and immediately following their training, they will come and see me where we have prior peripheral quantitative computer telemetry scans of the tibia. They then get to go home with a TREXO that is fitted for them, and they get to use it for 12 weeks, so three months of training, where their goal is to obtain 30 minutes a day for five days a week of walking with a TREXO trainer. All of the TREXOs are controlled by a tablet, which controls speed, um, and it counts how many steps and the duration of the use. For the PQCT scans, I have prior images of the three for the 18 66% sites of both tibia. So that gives us trabecular and cortical bone respectively and then muscle. So we get measures of total bone mineral content, cortical bone mineral content, trabecular and cortical bone mineral density, cortical thickness and muscle cross-sectional area. I would like to draw attention to this image here on the right. Um, <laughs> a huge limitation of our study has been getting participants positioned comfortably in the scanner to reduce motion artifact um, while scanning. So this is a participant successfully in the scanner. We have this very strange chair sitting on top of another chair with a whole bunch of straps. We have an iPad to make them kind of distracted in the show and we dimmed all the lights. This is about version six of the chair that we've tried. We've gone through many iterations to be able to make it work. So I just want to touch on a couple of those to, to kind of highlight how difficult it has been to acquire these scans. So as you can see on the far left scan, this is what our scanner looks like up close. There's a holder for your foot on one end of the pantry and a holder for your knee on the other. For this, you need to have your leg essentially completely in the scanner so that we can acquire that 66, which is quite close to the knee. So initially, we started with participants laying down. However, they weren't overly comfortable with being on their back in a strange room. So that didn't work overly well. We moved on to an EOS chair, which is a chair specifically designed for spinal x-rays. However, it was far too rigid to be able to actually acquire the scans. It essentially required excessive flexibility to be able to fit the scanner. Um, we then moved on to a chair sideways. However, typically, or children with CP are significantly smaller than typically developing children. And the scanner was designed for adults. So it was very hard to get them close enough to the scanner to get all three scans that we were looking for. And that's where we got to our last option, which is the tomato chair. This is a second image of it. It's the same as the one before, just two different sizes, which we've been getting great results from. So it's a foam chair designed for children um, to make them a little more comfortable. So on this scan, these are an example of three slices of the 338 and 66% site that you would expect to see. These are great pictures from Leanne Ward. Um, you can see on the 3% site, so that far left, you can see the tibia. Um, this red density, I think they can see it else. Um, this red density is the trabecular on the inside, and then you can see the white, white cortical shell on the outside. Moving on to the 38% site, we can get our cortical thickness, density, and content. And then on our 66, we can see the muscle and the fat. So we can get muscle cross-sectional area, density, and then we can get an estimated, an estimated strength of their muscle. Um, all three of these scans are great. They'd be great to analyze and have very minimal motion. However, we do see some of the streaking on the 66 percent site. In contrast, these are some of the scans that we've been acquiring in the population of CP. So the last three scans are of children with cervical palsy, and the one on the right is of a typically developing child. You can see that all three on the left have significant motion and artifact in them, while the one on the right is very minimal and you have a clear defined um, bone. 
the far left scan, we are able to analyze. However, the two middle ones, we weren't able to analyze. So that's just an example of what they look like. I'd also like to point out something that's very unique that you can see on this one. Because when you look on it's typically developing a slice, you can see that there's a lot of density in here. However, moving to the three children with cerebral palsy, there's huge gaps without that trabeculite forming there, um, which we'll see in the results as well. Lastly, I'd just like to frame our results. So all of the data that we get from those three pictures gets converted to age, sex, and ethnicity match sense scores to the typically developing normative population. So that means all of the values that we'll be looking at are standard deviations above or below the mean of a typically developing population. I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that 99.7% of normally distributed population fall within plus or minus three standard deviations. So just keep that in mind when we're looking at our next few results. They're significantly lower than what we expect to see anybody in a population, really far off skewed left on that percentile curve and very low values. I'd also like to note that due to the limitations in requiring scan due to the difficulty of getting motion, we only have three participants that will be showing um, it drops down to one for the farther two scans, so these are three participants in the scanner, and of those three, they vary based on their diagnosis, age, GMSCS level, and their usage of the term scanner. So with that, on the left of these next few slides, you'll see the baseline and follow-up images of that respective site stacked on top of each other. And in our first figure, you can see the z-score at baseline and follow-ups, both pre- and post-trial. So in this one, our trabecular bone mineral density ranges from 5.9 standard deviations to 0.3 standard deviations below the mean of a typically developing child, adjusted for that participant's age, sex, and ethnicity. All three of our participants are color-coordinated, and then both legs were scanned, so if they had a valid scan, you'll see their um, the, the respective legs shown up. So altogether, all three of our participants are significantly lower than where we'd expect them to be on a typically developing child on their um, standard deviation. However, all three are improving over the course of the trial. This corresponds to an 8.6 28% improvement in their Z score over the trial, which is quite promising as this is after accounting for the normal growth we would expect to see in growing children. Moving on to our total bone mineral content that we've acquired about 3% size as well, you can see once again they're significantly lower than what we'd expect them to be at. So they're 3.5 to 7.2 standard deviations below the mean of a typically developing child for that measure. However, once again, all three participants are improving over the trial. This corresponded to a 4.7% improvement to a 46% increase in their Z score, which once again is quite promising after as it's accounting for the normal growth we would expect to see. Moving on to our 38% site where we got our cortical measures, we saw that their cortical thickness is significantly lower than what we'd expect. Um, on these ones, you can see that we have a couple additional participants who didn't have valid, didn't have valid baseline and follow-up scans, um, but we included the scans so you can see the kind of the distribution of the population. Again, this participant is increasing over the trial. So this corresponded to about a 2.6% improvement, which is greater than our 1% mean clinically relevant value for the scanner indicating that there is a change outside of chance. Cortical bone mineral density is a very unique one in children with cerebral palsy. It's generally higher than a typically developing child. So as you can see in our results, it matches that what the literature is suggesting with 1.3 to 1.89 standard deviations above. However, it is also still improving over the trial. So this corresponded to about a 28% improvement um, over the three months of walking in a Trexel trainer. And lastly, looking at our muscle cross-sectional area, you can see that there once again is an improvement over the trial. I'd like to note here that it's very cool to see um, you have both participants' legs on this plot, and you can see that they, they differ drastically. So we range between 3.7 and 4.2 standard deviations between the same participant with a left and right leg. All of the participants shown on here do have bilateral impairment, so both legs are equally impaired. However, you still do see some of that jumping. With that, all of our bone and muscle measures seem to be quite promising. Uh, they are all improving over the trial outside of what we typically expect to see. But I'd also like to highlight some of the additional study findings that we found. So overall, we found an ability to walk independently in the Trexo, which is quite revolutionary. Participants, caregivers, and researchers have noted that the participants have had improved mood, increased sleep duration, and number increased bowel movements, as well as their increased food consumption. They've had a slight improvement in their head control after walking in the Trexo, as well as a slight reduction in spasticity, and altogether an increased social engagement. So our trial altogether is suggesting that the Trexo is having a great improvement into overall quality of life. With that, I'd like
like to thank the members for buying this kit lab for all of their help and inspiring these are our PCCT scans, as well as the Plumbing Lab for organizing for leading the trial, as well as our patient partners in professional robotics, our funding sources, and list above and the institutes for support. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Erin. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Venus. Uh, based on the patient, so, uh, at the level of the muscle, so how do you differentiate between the muscle, contract like collagen, fat, and the tissue that you have to measure the quantity? We don't actually, um, the resolution is not high enough to separate those fine details of the muscle, so we quantify it all in one. So we essentially use a thresholding, and method fresh folding method to remove the fat from the muscle. Um, and it's just a standardized value that the literature is suggested that would uh, fit for pretty density of each. So the, whole, the muscle as a whole, like yeah, has a contact on the area increase in size? Yes. <clears throat> and then after elimination of the fat component? Yes, yes. Is there a reason you picked PQCT instead of HRPQCT? Yes. Um, so HRPQCT would be great to get that micro architecture of the bone. However, it requires our participants to sit extremely still. Um, it's slightly longer in their scan acquisition time, which I don't think would be feasible with this population. Even with how much motion and artifact we've been acquiring, um, I think it would invalidate all of the scans of HRPQCT. Jackie? Just as a, out of curiosity, how long does it take to do like, one of the scans of the leg? It takes about five minutes from starting the scale view and doing the free scale scan. So that the scale view is just an x ray to find the link located somewhere in the body. I know this isn't the focus of like kind of your part, but do you have any explanation of why you think the spasticity would decrease with the training? It's just kind of interesting. That's a great question. I think increasing the muscle strength and having that go through the normal motor patterns has been calming down the reactivity of the yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that's a good question. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Michael? Sure. Um, for the muscle analysis, kind of building on <coughs> this, um, why did you decide not to use MRI? It would help you. Uh, likely going back to the modality, MRI does still require you to sit fairly still. It does also have a higher radiation dose. So the radiation on this is marginal, less than one microsieve of a scan. So we're getting less than six total, uh, whereas MRI is significantly higher. So we likely could have done that in combination to get a little bit more accurate, but having one point there was far more convenient. And then I guess the follow up similar, if, uh, if the having them sitting still is an issue, did you try just using normal CT since that's like 10 seconds, five seconds for a scan, super fast, and then looking just could you correlate, you know? No, we didn't look at that one. That would oh, be a sure. really interesting thing to look at. Potentially, if we could get the same data without having to use that modality. Yeah, or I'm even thinking if you could have the control subjects do the HRPQCT plus the CT, which, yeah, someone's going to be like, oh, there's excess radiation, yeah. but whatever. It's really no radiation anyway. It's like two flights across, you know, the ocean, whatever. It's yeah. Nothing. Um, but then you could try to correlate, you know, if you have the CT scans for the for the um, CP kids, and then you have, you know, with the typically developing kids, you have CT plus HRP, QCT, and then you could devise a relationship with the two and then predict your HRP or your HRP, QCT measures from your CT scan measures. I don't know. That would be a really cool project to kind of get all three, all different modalities kind of getting the same information. Yeah, it's tricky. It's interesting, though. It does require these weird changes. Venus? Yeah. Um, so, uh, is there any training like that it usually done with children with the people that you learn uh the way exercise and then you try to compare like the water to the usual training that they do use? So because all of our participants are non-ambulatory, a couple of them are undergoing physiotherapy. So a lot of it, because of the, the degree of impairment, they have difficulty standing upright and a lot of the traditional therapy things have risks of falling and causing greater fragility fractures or fractures just from doing the, the activity. So we're really trying to assess the feasibility of using a walker that has a stable frame already built in um, and then what that impact would be. So we don't actually have a reference to what it would typically look like. Um, most of the literature only does looks at GMSCS one or two, so that ambulatory population. 
Um, so we can't quite draw a correlation between the gains that we're seeing from the walker versus other dyslexic patients. Um, you said that the goal or kind of like the threshold to hit was five times a week for at least half an hour, right? Yes. And then, I don't know, like it seems like the kids in these photos like are really enjoying walking, like people who surpass that. Is it a common thing that people have been like enjoying using this technology? Yes, uh, participants have been loving this. Uh, a fair number of our participants after the fact have actually purchased their own device to continue using it. So it's like commercially available? It is commercially available. It is a little costly, but it is commercially available for families. There's also a couple additional programs that we have at the Children's Hospital where participants can come in and use it in the clinical setting. Um, but yeah, it, they've been loving it. Um, yeah, they, they, awesome. Yeah, they've Thanks. exceeded it all the hours. I can't tell you the exact amount, but most of them exceeded that. Like went above and beyond. Yeah, cool. Question in the back. Um, in the walkers, can they go outside, like if you're in the dirt, in the sand, or are they typically used inside settings in they can go outside. Uh, they have a couple limitations that the wheels are fairly small and they get rocks and things stuck into it. So a lot of the participants or those who have purchased their own device have made upgrades to it and made big wheels, which make it um, more off-road capabilities, aka off sidewalks. Um, but it is designed so that it can go outside. Granted, there are limitations, so it doesn't like snow, it doesn't like rain, uh, but I, ideally that could be uh, fixed in the future. Do you think that you could get like additional muscle architecture me measures from your scans? Like I know they're like cross-sectional scans, right? Like, but could you, would it be possible? And maybe this is like difficult with a motion artifact, but could you do like a 3D reconstruction to get like other architectural parameters, like things like nation angle or muscle thickness kind of things like that? I don't know if you'd be able to, because it's highly dependent on how you position them in the scanner. So we're really just getting that cross-sectional area at that one slice. So it just increases you can get more of that 3D shape of it because you have a greater distance you can extrapolate, but at the one like two millimeter distance, it could change very drastically on either end of that big shape. And then so sorry, your cross-sectional area. So that's is that a maximum? How is you how are you gaining that throughout the length of the muscle? Uh, it's just at that one site. So it's oh, just the one site. Yeah. Okay. So it's just um, essentially if you took a picture straight across. Okay. Um, Gotcha. Any last questions? Yep, Art. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you were concerned with uh, MRI radiation, and I just want to ask what do you mean by that? Um, MRI is a significantly higher radiation dose than PQCT in, in how we've been using this. Um, so a lot of these children have medically complex issues to begin with, so they do get a fair number of x-rays outside of uh, clinical studies. So a lot of the families were concerned about the radiation exposure and having excess radiation. Um, in addition to that, MRI doesn't typically have a standardized data set to look at, um, especially not this population. Well, I was under the impression that MRI uh, does not have ionizing radiation oh, like x-rays. Yes. Sorry, you're uh, correct. <laughs> yeah, you, you do get a huge magnetic field, but as far yeah. as I know, that's pretty safe. Yes, sorry, I was thinking of oh, cancer. Yeah. yeah, so I, I think I'm going to agree with you, though, your concern about time, because you have to stay very still in an MR regime. Any other questions? No? Awesome. Well, thanks again, Erin.